products and, and best group of people out there. Michael McCormick from Reistead Energy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. All right. Um, so, you hear me okay? I'm, uh, I'm going to do, a, as I often do, a rapid fire round through both oil and gas and, and offshore wind, try and cover some topics. I'm really excited for sort of the broader discussion as well. So, um, with that, I think I'll kick off with uh, what we're probably sick of talking about, which is, you know, oil demand uh, and, and all of the almost infinitesimal uh, scenarios that could play out in the world. And so what this chart gives you is essentially a max, almost maximum fan of outcomes going from a 1.6 degree normative sort of goal-seeking type of environment at the low end to you know, where we would be if we didn't do anything uh, in terms of changing our consumption patterns and the, eco the economy and the population were to develop just as it was originally uh, you know, to be done with basically no substitution. And then I think what you can see through the many wedges here <laughs> is there are a lot of different steps that need to happen, right, to get us from BAU to 2.2, 2.1, all the way down to a Paris compliant type of scenario. Um, and I think what we've recognized, the, the sort of the, the, the commodity forecasts of the world have, have also recognized increasingly is that, you know, all of these sectors, obviously geographies as well, are progressing at different paces, right? Um, where the upper wedge, kind of the, the green there, is the electrification, which is sort of the most, potentially the most rapid decarbonization initiative. Um, then you have sort of the, I guess, the, the topic that'll be talked about quite a lot here uh, this, this week, uh, maybe less than last year, uh, would be the fuel substitution in shipping, aviation. Uh, those are, have, we've seen, been very more, much more difficult, essentially, to, uh, to displace. There's issues around bunkering, you know, uh, transport and handling of things like uh, ammonia, methanol, but there's a lot more <laughs> concern, frankly, around willingness to pay and whether you need a carrot or a stick and how you, how you sort of normalize for that. Um, and then obviously the bottom end of the fan is, is a lot of sticky, uh, very hard to displace, pet chem, plastics, and so on, where, you know, demand growth far outstrips efficiency gains. And, uh, and so with, with all that said, we see things moving at different paces in sectors and obviously in geographies. Um, and this is more, a little bit of a data point for you, just about where we are now as a firm in our base case versus last year. Um, so last year we actually made a call and held that call I think for two or three years that the EV boom would drive a, a peak by 2026 or 2028 in that range, give or take. Um, as of maybe a quarter ago, we've, we've moved and we're pushing out our base case to 2030 and, and frankly could go, could go further out than that. So we see more runway, net-net, uh, slower uptake in, in, a, in a lot of these technologies. We're still very ambitious and bullish. And by the way, the other two scenarios are very much possible. Uh, it's just that the number of standard deviations is maybe increased a bit from, from last time. Um, and by the way, this is our view. There's certainly no consensus here. I think if there is a consensus, it's very spread. And it has moved to the right, as we have. Um, but, you know, there's this, this scenario is also quite plausible, right, uh, which is OPEC's uh, scenario for, for long-term oil demand that they put forward. So with that, all that in said, uh, let me bring it to sort of the, the world we're here to talk about, offshore oil and gas, uh, you know, and the services that go into that space and the vessels. Um, so what I've done is just overlaid, right, the producing uh, barrels of oil from fields and wells that are drilled today, and then those that are under development, meaning they're post-FID, they're going to happen. Um, and even in sort of our mean case, which is this emerging base case peak at or around 2030, uh, we see there's a gap that needs to be filled by the time of that peak of almost, uh, well, more than 55 million barrels per day of oil. So we need still quite a dramatic amount of activity, drilling, uh, vessels, platforms, to even meet that ambitious, frankly, scenario that we, that we hold in our base case. And um, if I roll this forward, you can see what that call, so just the delta between production and demand, uh, looks like in the other two scenarios. And I think one key point here is that even in a 1.6 degree scenario, the dispersion of that call doesn't really widen out until the late 2030s. So you still need a lot of oil, even if 
we as a society decide that we are going to move to some, something that, uh, that aggressive. And of course, as you move to a higher demand call, you're getting quite a lot of uh, uh, new barrels needed. A lot of that needs to come from sources we don't know about today, right? So if you're a believer in sort of 2.2 and a beyond, exploration's the name of the game. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, actually. Just very briefly, just high-level oil price call. I think the first order thing we often do, you've seen us in conferences probably say, you know, what is the cost of supply that's going to deliver this call on oil? Um, and this is very simple. If you draw the, the sort of distribution of break-evens, our base case might suggest 60 to $80 a barrel long-term in real terms, in Brent terms, right? Um, but I think what we've also realized and sort of the world has changed in some ways, is that there are above ground risk premia and, and changes in terms of capital availability to this industry, which makes a huge impact on what the true marginal cost of supply is, right? We, uh, we aren't lending, uh, particularly in Europe, to oil and gas firms at the, at the rate that we once were. Um, there's been several geopolitical shocks in the last two years. So realistically, 80 to $100 Brent long term, adjusting for these risks, not at all unreasonable and not far from where we land on our base case. So um, I think that's kind of all I'll say on the macro picture. I know that maybe that was a lot. Um, but maybe I think what I want to talk about again is we have a, um, an up cycle here that's uh, pretty much been sustained since 2021, since the pandemic uh, ended. Uh, this is offshore investment outlook uh, for, for the globe. Uh, and it's broken between development capex, that would be drilling and, and building out of new facilities versus exploration capex, right? And um, I think, you know, we're big believers in this scenario. There's a lot of runway. Offshore oil and gas is going to com contribute an outsized proportion of new supply in that call fan that I was showing earlier. Um, what I'll say is that I think we are conservative on this call. Uh, I think there's two big upsides here. One is the amount of value that can be captured by the supply chain. Uh, via vessels, uh, services, cementing, those types of things. And another is exploration. And I'm going to like step through those in a bit more detail now. So with that, and I promise I'll get to offshore wind, um, I think we, uh, we, when we talk about sort of exploration first, I, I think this is an interesting one. Um, you know, decades ago, before I was probably a professional, um, we talked about uh, reserve replacements, um, I guess we talked about it when I, <laughs> since then, but uh, what I've done here is just shown a peer group of essentially the IOCs um, and, a, and a couple of other offshore focused players and looked at their you know, M&A adjusted discoveries, meaning organic discoveries everywhere but shale, so everything conventional oil and gas, um, against their net production, right? And uh, you've seen these charts for a long time, uh, but this industry has not prioritized exploration, has not had successful exploration when it has, with some exceptions, Guyana, uh, Suriname, Namibia, some other more recent ones. But when you add M&A, uh, you get quite a different story. And, and this is perhaps an explanation for why exploration has been so muted, is that for this peer group, uh, we have seen essentially reserve booking through M&A, at, you know, in most cases, much more so than through exploration. So we see uh, that these guys have continued to replace more than two-thirds of their uh, reserve replacement is coming from M&A, and only a, a third of that, roughly speaking, is coming from actual exploration. Now, that hasn't come for free. Uh, so this is just, again, sorry for the data dump, but I think it's, we're getting there. Uh, this is the cost of buying those barrels. So. If you're buying a producing barrel, that's a producing field that's going to cost you a lot. You've sunk your development capex. You're paying for flowing barrels. Um, on the lower, the lower bar is the, the discovery, which is pre-developed barrels. It's known resources, but you need to develop it once you acquire it. And what we have seen is that it took a while, and it was trending sort of against the flowing barrels for, for a couple of years. Uh, but eventually, uh, around 2022, there was an inflection point where the value of those pre-development barrels started to go up, right? And so we are up almost 100% on those discovered barrels, and that can be seen uh, in comparison to 
the finding costs of that same peer group over the same time. And what it tells me, at least, is that we have reached a point of parity where finding costs could potentially be lower than uh, purchasing your way to more reserves, essentially. So are we at an inflection point? I think that we are, personally. Um, you hear a lot of it. I think what we'll see eventually, hopefully, is, is expanding exploration budgets. But uh, I think there'll be more to come there. And then I think so that's one upside. And then the other upside uh, is, I would call it, the, uh, the cost uh, increase or value gain potential for the services in the developments, that bigger part of the CapEx stack. right? And I'm showing you this. I showed you this chart last year. Uh, this is you know, new fixtures for ultra deep water floaters. I can use this because I'm up here as a proxy for the service pricing in the industry. Um, we are passing 400, 450 for term day rate. We're touching above 500, up, upwards to 550 on a very short term and exploration or just one off well type of day rates. Um, this typically drives a lot of costs in an offshore development. Your day rate for the rig will usually be tightly correlated with vessels. I don't know where, uh, you know, your, your OSVs that Quinn's going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, so what about flexing this cost and also flexing the, uh, the costs for the rest of the sort of scalable costs in these projects? How quickly can we kill the offshore story is essentially the math that I'm going to show you. Um, so this is all of the pre-FID uh, deep water discoveries. Forgive me for the chart, but it's based on their IRR in our base case, unlevered IRR just from the project costs and our assumed oil price. Um, and you'll probably be surprised by the very high IRRs. That's typically subsea tiebacks, which are very much benefiting from sunk infrastructure costs from nearby platforms that were designed to take those subsea tiebacks. But what I can tell you is typically, and, and in some cases is explicitly communicated, is that the hurdle rates for new FIDs in the likes of uh, Exxon, Total, Chevron is typically 15 to 20% if they don't communicate around a break-even hurdle rate. Uh, some, some do both. So how many projects can I kill, uh, meaning get them below that FID hurdle rate by increasing the day rates? And that's the sort of math we've done, right? Um, in this second and third two lines, the orange line is assuming a $500,000 day rate for every deep water project, which is not the current earned day rate for the vast majority of rigs out there. That kills about 15% of those resources. So what that tells me is this whole industry can reprice at 500 and we'll lose only about 15% of those FIDs. So to test the biggest extreme, uh, we did the same for $800,000 a day. And that's obviously when you start to materially eat into the returns of these projects. Again, and maybe I didn't say this, this is also allowing those spread costs to inflate at the same rate. So we're saying how much can OSVs go up, how much can subsea vessels, uh, cementing services from Halliburton, how much can those increase without killing the economics of the projects? And I guess the point I'm making is probably another 40% up, upside to what they are today. Now, will that happen? That's a function of supply and demand. This is more of an extreme type of situation. So, um, wind with a few minutes left. I think we know the story well, uh, all of us probably that have looked in the space. Uh, wind is one of the options uh, to decarbonize your power generation um, out there. And typically, when we think about where offshore wind has been built up, we think Europe and we think China and we think hopefully soon US, you know, if, if you're in that space. Um, but I think. What's happened with wind is somewhat sort of um, embedded in the broader green transition uh, and somewhat of its own sort of own issues. But I think what, what happened with wind and with other green segments is we just saw a lot of ambition, a lot of investor pressure around decarbonization, um, which essentially pushed the oil majors, uh, the, what is now Ersted, to essentially transform to diversify, to take investment in, and potentially invest in things like offshore wind. Um, we also had relatively high power prices and decreasing costs in that industry due to the turbine sizes growing and basically a race to the bottom on the OEMs, trying to 
outcompete each other to win volume to scale up their operations and win that aftermarket that everyone is going for in the turbine markets. So this was the momentum going to 2021. Uh, what's happened since, I think it's, it's emblematic of everything we've seen, but it's really about energy security taking center stage. It's about supply chain not being able to have the visibility that it needs to scale up in time for when the demand was there. Um, and it's about cost of capital growing via higher interest rates. So we're seeing the kind of triple whammy effect in offshore wind, where I think the most unique one to offshore wind is that supply chain, in that you've got a very concentrated main provider of turbines, which are struggling mightily, uh, or were previously. And you have uh, an industry that really doesn't exist uh, in places outside of Europe, Western Europe typically, and China. So it's been, a, it's been a difficult, I would call it 24 months, maybe some would call it longer. Um, but I think there have been some good signs, um, and I'll leave you pretty soon with, with them. But I think the first good sign of switching from a very negative sentiment to a more positive one was in the UK, we had their round five, which had a maximum tariff, which is essentially how much you can bid as a maximum to get remuneration for your offshore wind project of 44 uh, pounds. That got zero bids, so that was a complete failure. Um, but in round six, the subsidies, the maximums were increased basically from the regulator. They said, we, we understand what's happening in this industry. We're accommodating this because we want offshore wind. They increased more than 50%. Uh, similar increases in floating wind, which I haven't really talked too much, but I guess it's everything I said, but a bit worse. Um, and in the US, we have seen some pretty much green shoots, I would say, following the very bad summer that we had last year uh, in the fall, where we had uh, Ersted walking away from ocean winds, a uh, number of other projects basically pulling back on their development plans. Um, but we did see Empire Wind be awarded that remuneration scheme uh, next, yeah, I'm sorry, about two or three months ago. Um, the only thing that's a bit the US is gonna be behind is A, the election, which I think we've already had some experts uh, comment on. There's a lot of uncertainty around offshore wind and its future before this election. Uh, so if you have the ability to wait, I think some will. Um, and I think the supply chain again. So this New York 3 was a potentially positive situation in, uh, in November of last year. We had a, a new round awarded, but at the same time, about a month, two months ago, GE Vernova canceled the 18 megawatt turbine design, which essentially nullified their ability to develop according to the plans that they presented to the New York, develop, uh, the New York State. So that has been canceled. I think of that as just a one-off delay. They'll accelerate, renew that. So I'm, I'm still positive on, off, on the US offshore wind. One more thing I think I'll talk about, I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time, is just tying it back to vessels here. Um, this is sort of, the outlook for when a vessel is needed and what kind, so the rows are individual types of vessels. The columns are sort of the stages in a life cycle of an offshore wind farm. We can see that you know, in some cases you can have at least 10, maybe even more unique vessel types. I'm not even including dredgers or, or anything like that in this, um, that are needed per wind farm. And as wind farms become larger, they become further from shore, they become more standardized you will need more and more specialized vessels uh, to accommodate the development of this, uh, this industry. So there is still a massive opportunity, and I think I'll leave it with just, again, just an example of the turbine installation vessels, right? These are the, the main vessel. I, I guess we have uh, a company here speaking later on that. But the turbine installation vessels are what's driving the, you know, the, the market and the lack of availability of them, even in places like the US. So we've got uh, still, even after risking our forecasts on vessel demand, we have a shortfall of these vessels that you guys need to help <laughs> basically solve. Otherwise, we're not gonna get uh, this wind build out that we're, we're seeking. So we've, we've seen a lot of this negativity, but I think what we, what we see now is the emerging positive story. Governments are being willing to pay for the more expensive offshore wind than what we thought maybe three years ago. So that's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Mike, for that very bullish presentation. Um, and up next, we have our in-focus session with Quinton Keane, President and CEO of Tidewater. So if you guys can come, and, and Andrew Showitt, sorry, who is the Head of Ocean Industries for North America, DNB Bank. So come on up. <laughs> 